On today's episode, we speak to Dr. Monique Tello, an internal medicine physician at Women's Health Associates at Mass General, who wrote a book called Healthy Habits for Your Heart. First, we talk about the interesting way that she got the book deal and then dive into the science of habits, how to start a habit, how to discontinue one, how long the process takes, the psychology of habit development. The second half of her book is a list of 100 heart-healthy habits. So we discuss a few of those. This is an important book and interview for any healthcare practitioner that counsels patients on diet and lifestyle and wants to make evidence-based, practical recommendations to their patients. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians, where Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have learned while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. This podcast is intended for medical professionals. The information is to be used in the context of your own clinical judgment, and those on this podcast accept no liability for the outcomes of medical decisions based on this information. As the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice. And even though the magic of podcasting may make it seem like we're speaking directly in your ears, this does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. If you have a medical problem, seek medical attention. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On today's episode, we have Dr. Monique Tello. She's an internist at Harvard who recently wrote a book called Healthy Habits for Your Heart, 100 Simple Effective Ways to Lower Your Blood Pressure and Maintain Your Heart's Health. So we're going to talk about the book and some important information that she learned about the science of habits when she was writing the book, and some interesting stories she has to tell about the bumpy ride on the way to the book and the book's release. So Dr. Tello, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you, Dr. Block. (laughs) So first, my first question is, is cold exposure good for your heart? Because there seems to be a lot of that going on in your past. You, You grew up in Boston went to Brown for undergrad, med school at University of Vermont, med peds residency at Yale. You then did your combined uh, GIM and MPH program at Hopkins. And shout out to my sister-in-law, Lauren Block, who actually did the same program. And now you're, you're back in Boston practicing at Women's Health Associates, which is a small MGH-based primary care practice with all female providers that serves predominantly female patients. So you're back in Boston again. So that's that's, you know, your one break from the cold was in Baltimore. So is cold exposure good for your heart? You know, I, I, I don't know, but I can tell you, we just went cross-country skiing and we taught our kids how to cross-country ski. And, and I, one of the major reasons we did that is because, damn, that is good exercise. <laughs> Any kind of cardiovascular in the cold is like an added level of, of like challenge for the body that I think is only good. Oh yeah. There's, there's this, uh, I think he's Belgian or maybe he's Dutch. He's called his name is Wim Hof. He's called the Iceman. And his his big thing is is cold exposure actually does have a lot of cardiovascular. I mean, I think it's a bit fringe, but basically making your body adapt to extremes in temperature is actually good for it. You know, the fact that we live indoors at 70 degrees all the time kind of makes us a bit a bit soft and challenging the body. And that's not actually the, the direction that I that I meant to take this, but uh, <laughs> so, so no worries. Again, thanks, no worries. Thanks, thanks for being on the podcast today. So before we get get to the book, let's start out with talking how you got the book deal. Because uh, I've heard you talk yeah. about that before and, and that was something I've never heard of before. So you started out as an avid blogger at generallymedicine.com. And then what mm-hmm. happened yeah, so Harvard Health Blog, which is sort of a, a branching out of Harvard Health Publications, was looking for health writers who were physicians um, who could write. They just they it's actually not that easy to find physicians who can who can write in a in a way that's you know enjoyable for the general public. And they were looking for physicians who specifically could translate research into uh, enjoyable English <laughs> and and sort of just describe and and discuss research articles for the general public. And so they were looking for, for doctors like me. And they said, hey, you have a blog. You blog about health stuff. Maybe you'd be interested in writing for us. Um, so I started writing for them like three years ago. And we quickly figured out that my favorite 
topics, the research studies that I was just, you know, I would jump on and I would say, hey, can I write about this Mediterranean diet study? Or can I, can I write about this exercise study? It was all this diet and lifestyle stuff. And, I, and quickly realized that's kind of my shtick. That's like my heart and soul. That's the stuff that I really like to write about and I'm most interested in. It's so relevant to my practice. And every time I got to read a, a research study, it was always beneficial for, for my patients. I felt like I was always able to discuss it on a higher level with them. Like, hey, I just re- reviewed this really cool study that shows if you increase your fruit and vegetable intake up to 10 servings a day, you're going to get more and more benefit, You know, things like that. So I had all these blog posts going up in diet and lifestyle. And Simon & Schuster, meanwhile, an imprint of Simon & Schuster, is focusing on health and wellness um, topics, saw those blog posts. And they were trying to find an author to write a book for them. And this is sort of the flip of how you usually think of a book deal happening. Usually, an author has a book idea. And they do the marketing research and they say, hey, I think there's a market for my book idea. And I'm going to query a publisher to see if they're interested in publishing my book. This was totally the opposite. Simon & Schuster, this, their new thing, the way that this imprint was, was, is looking at this, they come up with the idea. They do the market research because that's what they do. They're going to always do that better than the author. Every author is like, oh yeah, tons of people are going to buy my book, right? (laughs) Well, (laughs) that might not be accurate, but the publisher has the data. They have a grasp on this. So they wanted an, a doctor author who had like some street cred <laughs> to author a book about um, basically this book, Healthy Habits for Your Heart. They had picked the title. They had sort of picked the format that they wanted. They wanted it evidence-based. They wanted research review. They wanted habits. And, and they were like, would you be interested in writing this book for us? They literally cold called me. They just sent me an email. And I thought it was a joke. You know, I'm an yeah, acquisition editor. It was editor. like spam. Like, Take <laughs> yeah, the survey totally. and we'll send you an Amazon <laughs> gift card. Exactly. I had no idea. So, but I answered. I answered because it sounded so cool. I was like, "Is this for real? I'd love to talk to you." And and even even after that, I'm like googling this acquisitions editor to find out if they're a real person. Like it, it really it like took me so long to really believe that this was a real project, but it was. You know, the day I got the check in the mail for for the advance, I was like, "Oh, this is real. <laughs> this <laughs> yeah, is not a not, joke. It's not real it's until not it's in the bank account." I know. So we had deposited that check and I was like, okay, now I can relax. So I wrote the book and it was largely based on the the research I'd already covered for Harvard Health Blog and also very heavy on behavioral change theory and behavioral change. Um, you know, what we know about that from from primary care perspective. How do you get people to change their habits? So yeah, it really drew upon everything that I'm already doing and everything that I'm already interested in. It was actually not a hard book to write <laughs> from my perspective. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is great stuff, and I feel like this is the type of stuff that can be taught or should be taught in medical school, right? Like, mm-hmm. how do we give people practical advice? Because telling them to eat better, a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. they know. Fine, the study just came out that said that eggs are now bad again, right? So, I mean, I'm sure you have a lot to say about that specific. <laughs> Because if you tend to eat your eggs with a side of bacon and French toast at Denny's, it's very different from if you have your eggs in like a Western omelet with a bunch of vegetables, right? It's and then who tends to there's so many confounding factors in in something like that. So I don't want to get off on another tangent, but um, (laughs) you you know that practical information. But for the most part, yes, eat more fruits and vegetables. Don't eat a lot of Mm -hmm. junk food and high sugar food and high saturated like. Patients know this. Mm-hmm. When it gets into the the really narrow focus of like, is celery better for you than a carrot? The <laughs> vast majority of patients don't need that information because it doesn't make a difference. No. They need to know no. how. How do I eat better? Mm-hmm. How do I stop you know eating so much junk food? How do I quit smoking? I know I need to. They know all this. Like telling them the science and showing them gross pictures of lungs doesn't change anything. And actually, I think I remember reading the only thing that does decrease the rate of smoking is actually making it more expensive. So, right, you keep it, you keep it out of the reach of a population <laughs> who's already right in, you know, the lowest income bracket to begin with. So, so now mm-hmm. you're like, you're punishing them for, for this. So I think it's, it's fantastic that you, you were able to compile this information. So 
what do we do? What do we, what is it that we tell our patients? So one thing that I, that I saw in the book was that you recommend small habits, right? But then on the other end, you mentioned that there are these comprehensive lifestyle change programs out there. Those ideas Mm -hmm. seem to contradict each other. So how do you, how do you reconcile that? Yeah. So in the big picture, when you're a primary care doc or cardiologist or nutritionist or anybody, uh, and you're, you're sitting with a patient in front of you, got to meet with them where they're at. So there, there's a fair amount when you're, when you're one-on-one with somebody, you actually have a chance to interact with them, communicate with them. You're, you're thinking more about motivational interviewing and, and you're trying to figure out what do they know? What do they care about? And then leverage that. And you, you basically are negotiating <laughs> with, with your patient to try to figure out how to get them to, to begin to even think about change or to make changes. And then the changes themselves. So in, in the book, because it's basically me just putting everything out there, I'm not, I'm not interacting. Um, I kind of put it all out there. You know, you, I'm suggesting very small changes. Comprehensive lifestyle changes is basically just a series of very small changes. And so it's talking about all these little things and emphasizing that every little bit counts. Uh, it's not so much about the size of the change. It's more about the consistency of it. Just keep going one foot in front of the other. You know, if you walked uh, 50 steps yesterday, let's do 51 today. Like just little things adding up and just keep going. And that I'd say is the big picture. So the key is start small, but also start from something that they're comfortable with. So asking a question like, and, and I had a previous episode where I spoke to Stephanie Sog. Actually, she's at Harvard oh, as yes, well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and her, she had written a great article about how to talk to patients about their weight. Uh, and so that, that's what the podcast episode was about. And so I think, and she said, you know, don't use the word exercise, use physical activity and start from, so start from a place where they're comfortable, start from what they're doing already and just build from mm-hmm. there, but not with some overwhelming. But let's say you get someone who comes in with with the, these like pie in the sky ideas, and they're going to make these radical changes to their to their life, and they're going to turn everything upside down. How do you, do you? I mean, do you try to talk them out of it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I, I will say, you know what? It, it from what I've seen, it's better to start small. Let's start with a very small change that you could make today, literally today. Like, what's one thing that you could do? Today, you go home, what are you going to do? And that can usually sort of bring people down into reality. Like, okay, well, actually, if they, you know, they, they were going to go to the gym for three hours at four in the morning every day of the week. But, you know, what can they do today, right now, when they leave the office? And they might say, oh, well, I could get off the train one stop early and, and walk an extra half mile home or something. And okay, let's go with that, <laughs> you know, because that might be more realistic. Just sort of to really pin them down one small thing that, they can accept that they can do that day can sort of bring people to reality. How, how do you keep them accountable for these small changes? Because something like that sounds like it would be easy to do at the beginning, but then it rains and then it's cold and then it snows, right? And then and now suddenly that's it's not a habit anymore. So how do you how do you recommend keeping people accountable? Yes, the consistency part of it. In the book, I actually recommend a lot of other people's books in my book um, because I'm a big fan of that. And there's uh, an author named Stephen Guys who's uh, popularized the concept of micro habits. He's, his books are actually called Mini Habits, Mini Habits for Weight Loss. And they're all based on his own discovery. He was really out of shape, wasn't working out, couldn't seem to find the time. And one day he said, you know what? If nothing else, I'm just going to do one push up today, just one. It was sort of like a joke to himself, but he did it. And the next day he was like, well, that was easy. I think I'll do two. And then from there, it just sort of caught on. And, and he now is like this fitness guru and has all these best-selling books. <laughs> He's like a millionaire. But, uh, but the concept is just the consistency of the habit. What's the smallest habit? The smallest, like if, if you're telling, if you're trying to walk 10,000 steps a day, but you have a bad day or it's raining or you're really busy or you're sick... What's the smallest number of steps that you can accept that's going to keep your habit going? And that may be very little. You know, it might be like in your head, you say, I just want to at least make sure I can walk 100 steps, which, you know, pretty much anybody can do unless they're in bed all day. So just accepting that there's going to be times when you can't do your maximum, but in your head, it's not a fail. It's you're still doing it. You're just, you're doing the best you can. You're doing the smallest increment of that ideal habit. And that's, that's really key for keeping people in the game. A lot of people, if they feel like they've broken their, their streak, 
it's like, oh, I, I didn't get to the gym for three days in a row because I was sick. It's all over. I might as well just go have a Sunday and, you know, just forget it. I'm done. You know, it, it, and that sabotaging, that self-sabotaging is is really destructive. <laughs> Try to get people away from that and, and to understand it's okay. There's, there's going to be stretches where you're going to be doing less. But just to make sure that you have in your head, that's okay. That's acceptable. You just, you do the smallest that you can just to mentally stay in the groove. I feel like that's a that's a really important part of the counseling is that is the self talk. The self talk can be mm-hmm. really sabotaging. So people are really hard on themselves, and so if they'll if they miss one day, then oh, I'm a failure. I can't do this. It's another mm-hmm. thing. That I yeah. I think I think helping them manage their expectations sounds like a really important part of, of that. So okay, so you take something. You try to find something that they're already doing or something that they're very comfortable with, and then give them. Mm-hmm a very small increment so that they keep the consistency. So that's that sounds like a great way to start a habit. What does the mm-hmm. science say about, about keeping a habit? Like people say it takes 30 days to start a habit. I feel like people <laughs> just like making numbers up and saying something. Is there yeah. is there any data yeah. behind how to make it stick? Or at what yeah, the, point the one you reach you... The, uh, the event horizon and then it's going to yeah. stick indefinitely? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the one you always see, if you Google this, you know, how many days do I need to keep a habit in order to, for it to stick or whatever? The, the classic is 21 days. And, and that was based on like one study that was like really small. And I actually, I actually to go into this research in the book <laughs> and talk about really honestly, when you, when you look at all the research on this, it can take anywhere between 18 and like 1,800 days <laughs> to, to make a habit stick for some period of time. And that's arbitrary to like, you know, do the habit for three months, six months, a year, whatever. Honestly, you know, I think everybody's going to be different here. This is going to be so dependent on so many factors which is why, again, just emphasizing to people, look, just stay in the game mentally. If you have a bad stretch, it's okay. You just dust yourself off and you pick up where you left off and it's totally fine. So that exactly, it's sort of resetting the expectations, managing the negative self-talk, the self-destructive, self-sabotaging thinking. I think once we sort of deal with that and, and talk it through and get people not to focus on failure, um, but rather just to keep moving forward, it's really not a matter of like how many days does it take for habits to stick. It's really, it's really more about the thinking. How are they thinking about it? And I think also how are they thinking about themselves, right? Like why do runners run? Well, because they think of themselves as runners. So have you found any effective strategies for getting patients to think about themselves differently? Like the, the fitness guru that you talked about in the beginning, I'm sure there was an, a point of no return for him when he just started like, like that click that you're hoping for that, that day, like what smokers hope for, they hope for the day where they wake up and they just don't want to smoke anymore. But for him, it was, I'm sure there was a point at which he was doing pushups every day for so long that he started thinking of himself differently. So have you found any research or any methods that were effective to get people Mm -hmm. past that? Or it's just, just keep stressing the consistency and keep stressing the consistency. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of tips, tricks, and techniques. I've got a bunch of those in the book. One is to make rules, and a rule can be, you know, for for example, um, I saw this. I have a patient who was addicted to diet soda, which you know, there's studies showing that artificial sweeteners are pretty much just as bad for you as real sweeteners. They can trigger an insulin spike, and there's probably an addictive component here. And what worked for her is just one day she decided she made a rule for herself. She said, "I am just a person that doesn't drink diet soda." I am now a person that doesn't drink diet soda. Diet soda, it's just, I don't drink that. And, and she just decided and started talking that way in order to be able to quit that cold turkey. And, and for her, it worked. And for some people, that does work. Just using that, like labeling yourself, using a rule, uh, redefining and identifying with a behavior or habit can be really helpful for some people. And this is going to be different for everybody. But for her, it worked. She got off the diet soda. She was on a six pack a day. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever heard of soda quantified as a six pack before. <laughs> Usually, when you assume you assume a six pack is going to be some, something else, yeah, that's oh, that's that stuff, uh, the stuff's addictive. I'm telling yeah. you, it's it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that dopamine mm-hmm. release that you get from uh, from drinking the diet soda because it's so. I mean, there's a reason they call it saccharin, right? Because it's it's just so so sweet. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and that's the thing. Yeah. 
what about, I mean, you just mentioned it. You've already segued into my next question about, about discontinuing a habit. So any, we've, we've talked about great ways to start a habit, but what about discontinuing a habit? Yeah, it's, it's the flip side and it's very much the same. You know, if somebody's trying to quit smoking, for example, and they quit for, <laughs> I have a lot of patients who say, yeah, I, I've quit smoking. I've quit smoking 12 times. <laughs> you know, and, and they start up again. And, and what I try to focus on with people is, all right, that's awesome. Tell yeah. me what has worked for you those 12 times. What did you learn? What, what tripped you up? And instead of saying, oh, you failed, you failed 12 times. It's more like, okay, those were learning opportunities. It's awesome. You're trying. You probably have gleaned so much good, valuable information from those 12 attempts. Let's talk about it. So flipping everything to a positive there's no such thing as failure. I think I say this about 50 times in this book. There's no such thing as failure, only lessons to be learned. <laughs> you know, keep moving, moving forward. If you happen to relapse, it's okay. And this is where... So the, the last chapter in, in my book, I focus a lot on addiction, the overlap between bad habits and addiction, because so many heart unhealthy habits overlap with, with addiction. You just mentioned the dopamine pathway. Um, we know pretty well that sweet, you know, sugar and just the sweet, the taste sweet triggers the same pathway as cocaine. <laughs> it's, I mean, this is a thing. So talking about addiction and managing that as an issue is important for some people to be able to quit a bad habit. Sometimes they actually have to, to get treatment as if this is an addiction. And in the case of smoking, it absolutely is. So yeah, the beginning of of our conversation, you were talking about uh, finding where the patients are. Like you have to start from a place in w- a place where they're comfortable, where they're knowledgeable, and then build from that. Do you have any standardized questionnaires that you'll give to patients? Because realistically, these visits can be very time consuming, very beneficial, but at the same time, very time consuming. So if there's a questionnaire we can give them beforehand that will give us some usable information so we know where to start. I think that would be, you know, especially in the day of, you know, all of the clicking that we need to do and the numbers that we need to hit, making the visit a little more efficient, I think would be helpful. So is is there anything that you give out or that you found in your research that might be helpful? Well, we do. So in, in, in terms of if people are self medicating, so a lot of overeating, stress eating, sugar intake, smoking is self medicating for underlying psychiatric. Issue. So we, I actually, in the book, I think I threw the, I did, I threw the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 in there so that people could actually take the questionnaire. We offer them at all of our physicals. And so we have an idea if somebody's going to have like an underlying, obvious underlying diagnosis. People can always, you know, smart people can read the questions and answer them however they want. But for the most part, you know, we'll pick up people that have issues and that's helpful. What I would like to do, <laughs> getting to your point, what I would love to do is to also add in nutrition questionnaires and physical activity questionnaires. And there's a gazillion validated questionnaires like the Mediterranean diet. There's a 14 item questionnaire that was used in the big, huge Mediterranean diet study. There's, um, there's physical activity questionnaires that can get at how many minutes of what level of activity people are doing on a weekly basis. I would love to have that stuff. I would love to have that stuff. It would make my job so much easier, but we don't have that yet. <laughs> so I'm relying a lot on, on my questioning, you know, my own interview, especially at a physical or with a new patient. Um, I'm literally just asking people pretty much the same questions and writing that it is time consuming. It is. And the motivational interviewing piece of it, you know, I'll, I'll usually, we usually have to just pick one topic. If I have somebody who's overweight and smokes and has prediabetes, you know, you can't, you, you can't address the habits that are going to be helpful in one visit. You have to tell people, what do you want to focus on? And can you come back? (laughs) Well, that gets back to what you were saying at the beginning. It's small changes, right? You can't just turn this person's entire world upside down and expect that they're going to have a good outcome, right? Like those are the, that's the type of person that ends up in, in people magazine that everybody reading it thinks can be them, but it's not really realistic to expect that from our patients, right? You have to pick that small thing that then snowballs, right? You, you pick up one small habit and then you pick up another and another and another. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're a uh, hundred push-up every morning fitness guru. Yeah, exactly. You start with one push-up. And I'll tell people that. And, and I do, like, I point people in the direction of the resources that might be helpful to them. If they like to read books, 
I've given people lists of all of these books that might be useful reading for them, you know, besides my book. I don't care if my book works for them or not. Maybe somebody else's will work better. It's fine. I, I mean, if you're going to give a patient one book, I, I think uh, a book on habits is going to be a lot more useful than a book on nutrition. Because mm-hmm. yes. the habit's going to be, you know, for the most part, they know what's good and what's bad, right? Most people don't realize that a granola bar isn't, uh, and this is, you know, Stephanie Sog said, don't use good or bad. And I just use good and bad. I just polarize the food. But, <laughs> I know, I know. You know, granola bars aren't that far from cookies, but that's not really as as important as as developing the small habits. So the, the second half of the book, you go into 100 heart health habits. So mm-hmm. if you had a patient that you've, you're never going to see again, and it's a very brief visit, and you have to give them mm-hmm. one piece of advice from your book, one of those heart health habits, which of those would it be? Sure. Well, you know, we talked about some of the big picture stuff and the continuity, how important. So I, my big thing to emphasize to people who are thinking about changing their habits is to address the negative thinking. So that that part you know, aside, that, that would be what I would emphasize really is sort of the big picture. If you're not able to adopt a healthy habit or quit an unhealthy habit, don't despair. There's no failure. There's only lessons to be learned. Like that would be the most critical piece of advice is trying to address that thinking loop that tends to sabotage people as they're, they're trying to make changes. So that's probably the most important thing. But then if you had to go into specific habits, so if we're not dealing with just like the underlying psychology of behavior change, and we're actually like I'm standing in front of somebody and they're saying, what's the best habit that I can adopt today to make my life better? I would say, go out and walk. Just walk. I don't even care. Like whatever you're walking now, just walk a little bit more. (laughs) I don't care if it's like one step more. Just whatever you're doing now, add. (laughs) And that would probably be the the most powerful piece of advice. So when you were doing your research and you you were making your list, what made it onto that list that you thought you think of as maybe the most unexpected or the most out of the box or the most outlandish thing on the list that, that ended up making it to the list of a hundred heart health habits. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I had to, to sort of map them all out and figure out what was going to work in the book. And I'm, I'm actually flipping through the book right now because there's a few possibilities. You know, I think it's in the, in the weight loss section and, and um, it's not so much an outlandish, concept is the way I'm putting it. So my first um, number one weight loss habit is eat more and it's eat more fruits and vegetables. So, so that's sort of putting it in a way that's surprising, you know, and, and um, a little bit counterintuitive, but actually uh, seems to be effective. So eating more fruits and vegetables and just emphasizing what to eat that's healthy rather than telling people don't eat that bad thing really seems to be effective. So is so intuitively you think, I'm supposed to tell people, you know, all this bad things that they shouldn't be eating. But really, what tends to be more effective is telling them all the good things that they should be eating. And then they get full. They're full <laughs> They're full of the carrots and the apples and the berries, you know, and the kale. They're not going to eat as much processed stuff. And I think also that gets into the, the self-talk, right? If you're the type of person that fills your plate with vegetables, you're not the type of person that's going to finish a pint of ice cream afterwards because those two things are just not congruous so you're you're kind of like a mental it's like a mental trick right you're you're playing a little trick on the brain you're not telling yourself that you can't have the ice cream you're telling yourself that you're just going to eat more vegetables but after eating a plate of vegetables is the type of person that eats a plate of vegetables also the type of person that has a pint of ice cream you know most of the time no so you know i think that that probably helps as well oh my my other favorite that to me, it's not surprising because there's so much research on this, but that a lot of people are surprised by is the chocolate. So there's there's a gazillion studies showing that dark chocolate, uh, people who eat dark chocolate have significantly lower risk of cardiovascular events than people who don't. Typically, it has to be really dark chocolate, so greater than 60% cacao and not a ton um, because the fat and the calories will, will, the risks will outweigh the benefits at some point, but most people aren't going to be eating a, a ton of really. The... Um, the dose, <laughs> I think of it as a medication, dark chocolate. It's a med. Um, <laughs> the dose is <laughs> two to three servings of, and I like to use Ghirardelli squares, not because I get any money from these people. <laughs> Believe me, that'd be awesome. So I got like free, free samples of Ghirardelli chocolate, but they have the perfect dose, those little squares. Just <laughs> link them up in Twitter. Link them, link them in, you know, tag them in your Twitter account, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I know, I know, I'm just, uh, it's the academic physician in me, like resist that. But uh, yeah, two to three squares, two to three times a week is associated with significantly lower risk of um, of cardiovascular events. And I love, I love pointing that out to people, especially if they don't know. They're like, really? I can eat chocolate? That's so great. You know, it makes people so happy. Just don't like melt it and pour it over your ice cream. Probably just stick to it. <laughs> Chocolate. Yeah, that would that would again, yeah, that would sort of ruin it. So it just kind of has to be like on its own. But yeah, that, that's true. So, so one of my one of my favorites from the list was that you're not allowed to watch TV on the couch. <laughs> right? You're not allowed <laughs> you to watch TV on out. the couch. This is America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. This, is, the favorite, this is our favorite pastime. There's <laughs> few there are few things we love more than watching TV yeah. on the couch. And after dinner. So Which is where, a killer, killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been I've been reading that a lot lately. That the, the amount of time that we spend sitting, it just, it's. I mean, I've seen it's as bad for you as smoking. I mean, that sounds like something that's going to end up on the nightly news and isn't really. But yeah, as we spend so much time sitting down, that that sedentary and and exercising doesn't necessarily make up for it. But but where are we supposed to sit? Do you want us to like watch TV on a <laughs> bushu ball or something on a, on a versa or just stand or sit on the floor. Is it okay? And sit on the floor with the dirt and the bugs. Where are we yeah, supposed, okay. are we well, supposed let's, to do let's this? Talk about that. Well, you know, so, so there's a lot of studies showing that eating a, a large meal at night and then immediately either lying down or sitting is incredibly bad for you. Whatever you ate in that meal is going to be so much more damaging to your body. If you don't move around after and having the habit, developing the habit of walking, after eating. And this is this is sort of old school, right? People used to stroll after dinner and talk to their neighbors. This is sort of Italian, classic Italian, European, you think, even Central and South American. You know, people go out after dinner and socialize or they're doing stuff. I mean, traditionally, nobody sat down and did nothing after that last meal of the day. And that's really what we should be aiming for. So, not sitting down after dinner, especially not eating a big, huge, heavy dinner, not eating very close to bedtime. Like those are all, these are all pieces of advice I give people. If somebody's really, really, really into TV and I, I don't understand that because I don't watch TV. I actually do not watch TV except for football games. <laughs> and I'm usually hosting people. So I'm like running around crazy. But, I found um, you so really relatable show... up, up until you said that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, you, so you don't watch TV or you do watch TV? I do watch TV, but I don't follow organized sports. I think I just alienated ah, a lot of the audience. So the opposite. That's so funny. So, but there's people that really like their shows. And so, you know, we actually do have an exercise bike in our living room in front of the TV. And so, you know, if I wanted to, I could put on the TV and exercise. It's a, it's a Peloton bike. So I usually end up actually sitting on it to do Peloton, which is a whole nother level of activity. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, I just usually tell people like, If you have to watch a show, try to be standing up or moving around or doing something. And if people can link their favorite show with some activity, like, for example, streaming it at the gym, now they have gym equipment. Now you can do Hulu, you can do Netflix, you can do whatever. You know, streaming the show at the gym, people will link that. Watching their favorite show is is what they do when they're at the gym, and that's going to make that habit stick more. Or, you know, if they're going to be doing some yoga moves at night, after dinner while they're watching, you know, Walking Dead or whatever it is that they want to watch, that's going to help that yoga habit to stick more. If they just sort of link it with something they find enjoyable. So it'll work with people where they're at, but you know, all of those things can work. I think that's after they've caught up on all my podcast episodes. (laughs) Well, podcasts is so easy to to walk and listen. You know, you can, podcasts are great for, for exercise. You know, people can run, jog, they can be on an exercise bike, whatever, um, and listening to a podcast. You you've mentioned the the um, Mediterranean diet a couple of times, and now yeah. you mentioned the Mediterranean lifestyle of going for a walk after you're eating. So I I think uh, I wasn't planning on discussing it, but I, I think it certainly bears mentioning just because people ask that all the time. Hopefully, you don't alienate the CrossFit paleo or the carnivore or the ketogenic crowd. But what? It seems like you're advocating for the Mediterranean diet. When people say, "What is the best diet to follow?" So, so I is is it the Mediterranean diet? What is the, what is what does the research say about that? Yeah, so so in the book, I try to move away from that label and rather um, just sort of point it out as a pattern. So it's, it's basically a plant based diet. 
I mean, it, it's a healthy plant-based diet, and it can be adapted to different cultures. It, it doesn't have to be the traditional Mediterranean diet in terms of the foods that were available in Italy and Greece traditionally. Um, you can adapt this to any culture. There's a, a Southern-style Mediterranean diet, for example. There's, there's Indian-style. There's, there's all of these different variations on it. But the whole point, though, is that it's largely fruits and vegetables-based. Legumes, lentils, whole grains... And anything that's basically plants, minimal animals, and using healthier oils if you're going to use oils for cooking. And those those principles apply across multiple cultures. And so I usually just try to tell people this is a, a plant based dietary approach. And you know we call it Mediterranean, but really you know it that can be confusing to people. So I I, I try to get away from that term a little bit. So eat mostly plants. That that doesn't seem <laughs> like yeah. eat mostly plants. Not very processed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty. And I think the most, the more basic, uh, the recommendations is probably the better. And then people can in, interpret them, you know, with, within their, within their culture. I, I love how you, you put that. Exactly. Yes. And, and you got to work with people on this, you know, for some people, the idea of the Mediterranean diet really clicks for other people. They think Mediterranean, they think all of garden. <laughs> like, why are you telling me to eat pasta and cheese? I'm serious. I've been, I've been, patients have actually told me that. Why are you telling me to eat like lasagna. And so I thought that was bad. And I'm like, okay, let's go back. <laughs> let's just go back and like start over here, you know? So you're saying um, I, be, I can have patient. unlimited breadstick mm-hmm. and iceberg lettuce? <laughs> that's <laughs> <I know>. amazing. <laughs> I know. I know that, that doesn't really work. But um, then there's, there's um, I have a patient who is of Indian descent who um, had a physical, she felt fine. She had zero complaints. And because of some risk factors, including family history, we checked the hemoglobin A1C, not expecting it to be anything. It was 11.8. <laughs> Her A1C wow. was 11.8. She was asymptomatic and, and um, really like blew us away. I, we, che- we had to have her come back, recheck it. I was like, there's no way. <laughs> like, you know, and the, the lab order's like, are you sure you just did this? I'm like, yes, I'm going to recheck it. Um, and she's Indian. And her whole life, she'd, she'd gone through life being vegetarian and thought in her head, I'm vegetarian, so I'm healthy. But she was eating a ton of bread and and uh, potatoes and white rice based dishes, and you know we just didn't realize how bad things were. So she adapted. She she took the Mediterranean uh, plant based Mediterranean diet and adapted it to Indian culture, and sort of she just went wild with this and, and really changed her whole approach. She's out. She's featured in my book because she actually uh, got off insulin, and even today, you know, I, we just checked her A one C a couple of weeks ago. And um, it's 6.8 off of insulin, uh, which is pretty pretty damn good considering where she started. Considering where she was, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool. And she's done it all with, with diet and lifestyle. She's, yeah, she is on metformin, yes. <laughs> She'll be on metformin forever. But, but I, to get off of insulin and given where she was, I mean, this could have gone in a very different direction. So I'm, I'm so proud of her and she's, she's just incredible. But yeah, talk about adapting the, the uh, Mediterranean style diet. To culture, and she's a she's a great example of that. And that takes us back to the beginning, where you have to find out where they are, where they're starting from, mm-hmm. right? You, you use her culture and her knowledge of food and cooking, and then and then go from there. Yeah, yeah, it, and it really is. I mean, from a from a primary care standpoint, that's kind of what you have to do for everything. <laughs> and in, in a book, it's harder because you, you're not doing you know back and forth with somebody, communicating with somebody. But just putting all these options out for people. So the, the principles, the basic principles underlying it all, and then all of these a wide variety of options. Like there's more than one way to do this, guys. Like pick and choose what's going to work for you. And just don't give up. And that's sort of the big picture. That's the whole book in a nutshell. But I still recommend reading the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. There are a lot of yeah. great, yeah, a lot, a lot of great tips, a lot of great information. And, and I think it's important for physicians to read that and then recommend it to their to their patients because it can definitely help us change the way we practice. I, we didn't cover habits in medical school. And I think it's just so yeah. hugely important for physicians to know how to help patients make those changes. And you make changes through through habits. I mean, that's what I, one thing I tell my patients is, why do you brush your teeth? You, you don't, they're like, well, I don't want bad breath. I don't want my teeth to thaw. No, you brush your teeth because you always brush your teeth. You don't think, should I brush my teeth this morning? <laughs> Maybe no, you brush your teeth because you always brush your teeth. So the more of these healthy habits that we can we can help our patients to develop, the better the better off every everyone's going to be. Is there anything else that you learned in the book that you that you want to share before we wrap things up? 
Yeah, you know, I think that the biggest part of it that I learned was um, the recipes. <laughs> so, so they wanted recipes with the book, which which is cool because I was just starting to get into creating recipes. But this is again where you, you get into that am I worthy thing? I'm, I, when Harvard Health Blog first asked me to start doing recipes, healthy recipes, I was like, wait, but I'm not a chef. I didn't go to cooking school. And they were like, yeah, but you're a doctor and you have all this nutrition um, knowledge. Neither did background. Rachel Ray. She's got a show. I'm pretty sure <laughs> she she didn't go to cooking school. I might have. I know. There's, there's tons of famous chef, Paula Dean. There's people that did not go to cooking school and, and they've got shows and they're millionaires. And here I am like, wait, wait, is anybody going to like believe my healthy recipe? <laughs> you know? so and, and her job, get over that. <laughs> her job is to develop creative ways for people to treat their bodies poorly. And your job is to undo <laughs> all of the damage that Paula Dean has done. Yeah. Which actually she, when she was diagnosed with diabetes, she really, um, she stepped up. She was like, you know, a lot of my cooking is not good for you. <laughs> she needs to come up with the with the healthy cookbook, but but yeah. So so they wanted recipes, and that was a challenge for me because I was just starting to get over that insecurity around around. Um, it's okay that I suggest to people some healthy things to eat, <laughs> you know. And and so I did. I I jumped in and created these recipes, were sort of my own, and um, you know made them a gazillion times and tortured my friends and family. <laughs> With with um, testing testing meals and giving away free samples and everything like that, that was a, a learning curve for me. So getting comfortable with that and and feeling like I could put these in a book on paper and and it be published and nobody was going to laugh at me. You know that was that was definitely a little leap of faith. And I actually just did an episode with Colin Zhu. He he's uh, who who did go to cooking school. He's a family physician who does a lot of locums, and he's he's got a big presence on social media. So we in in that episode that's going to be as of recording, it's not out yet, but uh, it will be when I put this episode out. And he talks about a lot of the basics, you know, how to get started on a soup, how to get started on a soup, what are, on a stew, what are the what are a couple of ingredients that are. Uh, that are important in order to make things healthy and, and delicious at the same time. So this really segues well in, into that episode. So, so where else can people, where can people find you and where can they find the book? Ah, yeah. So the book is actually, people have told me they found it on the shelves at Barnes and Noble, uh, which is so cool. It's for sale online at Barnes and Noble, Target, uh, Amazon. And then my stuff's on Harvard Health Blog, you know, very closely mirrors what's in the book. And I'm actually, I'm going to be hosting a local cooking show pretty soon, which is going back to the whole recipe thing is, is pretty darn cool. And I'll put that up on my, on my, uh, my website. Uh, what, is, what is the website? So it's, uh, you can actually find it just by going to drmonitello.com. I started out when I started blogging 11, oh, maybe it's actually 12 years ago. I was anonymous when I started. And so my website and blog name was generally medicine because the idea was that my, my blog was generally about medicine, but also about parenting and kind of health and wellness and lifestyle and balance and all this stuff. So it's, the original title is www.generallymedicine.com. But now I've linked it to my formal website. So you can still, you can find it under www.drmoniquetello.com. So I usually tell people just Google Dr. Monique Tello, you'll find it. <laughs> it's really easy. So if you're looking for practical health and wellness advice, that isn't uh, that's science based and evidence based, and not just telling your patients to gargle turmeric or apple cider vinegar <laughs> or whatever the uh, the the voodoo of the day is. Please mm-hmm. check out drmoniquetello.com. Dr. Tello, thank you so much for being on the show today and taking the time to educate us about habits and how we can help our patients to help themselves. Awesome. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Could talk about this stuff all day. That was Dr. Bradley Block at The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Find all previous episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, and write us a review. You can also visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash physician's guide to doctoring. If you're interested in being a guest or have a question for a prior guest, send a message or post a comment.